So first of all, um, thanks very much for the invitation to go and speak. Uh, I realised that in 2010, I did run a training event at Fulbury Country Park um, in the sunshine, I do remember, and I think we did get to see Southern Hawker there. So uh, it's only 11 years since uh, I came back to go and talk about this. I'm um, sorry for the long title. Um, hopefully the talk won't be quite as long. Um, this is very much an introduction. Um, if you want to get into this, it's you know best to you look at some of the resources um, that I'll talk about in just a wee minute. Um, but there's lots and lots of opportunity to um, do lots of work here and find lots of new sites. Uh, so just in terms of resources, just very quickly, um, I'm a volunteer for the British Dragonfly Society. Um, the British Dragonfly Society has got a, a great website uh, you can go and have a look at. It's also got lots of information on its Facebook page. So if you want a quick response for identification of larva or adult, that's a very good place to go to. Um, there's also a new publication that came out this year, The State of um, Dragonflies in Britain in 2021. Um, very much worth a look, uh, looking at how distributions have changed um, in the last 10 years since we produced the, the UK Atlas, which was the, the second UK Atlas uh, of dragonflies. And lots and lots of work uh, has gone into that. So it's a, a very interesting read. If you want to um, start to get into larval identification, then really the best place to go to is um, the British Dragonfly Society um, guide, larval guide for both dragonflies and damselflies. It used to be two volumes, um, now it's just into a single volume, I think it's £7.50, um, but it's just an absolutely fantastic resource uh, to go to. It's got lots of images of the, dragon, the dragonflies and damselflies and also the key identification features uh, and really good pictures of them as well. Um, if you've got field guides, so you're going to get a field guide. The, really, the two best ones are um, from Small, Small Shire and Swalsh, British Dra Britain's Dragonflies. It's a photographic one, lots of digital photos and photos of larvae as well. Uh, and then there's the illustrated field guide uh, to the Dragonflies and Damselflies of Great Britain and Ireland, and that's by Brooks and Cham. Um, that's got Richard Lewington's illustrations, so it's really down to if you prefer illustrations, if you prefer um, digital pictures. But the Small Shire and Small Swalsh one has uh, many more images of larva, um, which may find useful. But both of, both of them have got larval keys um, and they're pretty straightforward to go and use. In terms of recording, which is obviously a key thing, um, I personally use iRecord. Um, I use the app on my phone most of the time when I've got reception. It's the most convenient method for me to use, um, but unfortunately I don't have a field notebook to refer back to. Um, go and have a look at iRecord, um, which doing some interesting things. Um, the records in iRecord go to the various different schemes and societies if there is a scheme and society for that taxa, um, and then they will get verified by them. Now, sometimes that verification can take a while, and we're fortunate in Dragonflies that Pat Batty is the Scottish recorder. She's incredibly diligent and hardworking, and she will validate and verify them, and usually the records will be up on the NBN within three to six months, so you will be able to see your records um, pretty quickly. Um, alternatively, obviously, um, the Wildlife Information Centre will happily uh, accept your Odinata records, they'll validate and verify them, um, and again, they will go onto the NBN Atlas. And it really, honestly, it doesn't really matter how the records get there, but as long as they're validated, verified, and are shared and get onto the NBN, that's really the most important thing, um, because then they're accessible to all. Now, I've taken some screenshots of um, the NBN. Now, what you can do with the NBN Atlas, if you've not used it before, is you can select uh, an area, a geographical area. Now, this is the Scottish Borders Council, um, but you can do national nature reserves. Uh, you can do triple SIs. Um, I haven't checked, actually, if you can do local nature reserves, but the polygons may or may not be there. But you can go and drill down, um, have, a, have a polygon, and then you can go and select for species groups. So for this, um, I've explored by species. So the species group was insects, then dragonflies, and then the dragonfly records. Um, now, this is particularly important because it gives you an indication of the level of recording that's taking place in an area, and it also gives you a really good indication of what species are there. So you've got 24 well, actually 21 different species there, and you've got the number of records. So you've got a reasonable amount of recorder effort, you've got 5,000 records, um, and you can have a very quick look at the, the various different species and you get an indication of what the most common ones are. So um, the record is the common blue damselfly with over a thousand records, as you'd expect. Um, but there's certainly other ones that are into the hundreds. So those are your expected species. And if you're starting to get into a species group, it's always worth knowing what you're most likely to go and see. 
So this particular information gives you a very good idea of narrowing down your species search. And really between the different areas uh, in, in TWIC that TWIC cover, uh, it goes really between about nine to 11 common species. Uh, the greatest number of species found are in the Scottish borders because they are furthest south um, and they've got species that are moving up from the north of England. Um, so that's why they've got so many species that have been recorded there. And they've also got um, vagrant species such as the red vein darter, which don't breed in Scotland, but do um, occasionally come here when they get a bit blown off course. Uh, and again, lots of coastal records. Also, the maps of the various different um, locations can show you where the recording has taken place and the recording indicates that not an awful lot of recording takes place in the upland areas and that's consistent between um, all the different areas but we'll carry on. So 21 species have been recorded in the Scottish borders, 18 species in East Lothian, again um, not a lot of um, recording obviously in the main agricultural areas because there's probably a lack of standing water uh, but then in the upland areas again um, there's a, a very limited number of recording. Uh, number of records. We've got less than 2,000 records, but we do have, you know, lots of records of, for example, say the, the common darter, um, very, very widespread, blue-tailed damselfly, um, common hawker as well, you know, relatively large numbers of records. So 18 species have been recorded in East Lothian. Moving on to the city of Edinburgh, um, quite a number of records, 3,600. Uh, again, the most common being the blue-tailed damselfly there. Uh, you can see the water of Leith, um, you can see the line of records uh, going through there. And there's no surprise that City of Edinburgh, Midlothian has got a very large number of records because Betty Smith, uh, the original Scottish dragonfly recorder, um, lived in Lone Head. So quite a number of the records are her, hers, I would imagine. Moving on to West Lothian, oh sorry, um, 14 species in City of Edinburgh, 14 species again in West Lothian, um, 2,000 records, so fairly well recorded, reasonably widespread, again upland areas, um, not so much recorded in, so opportunities there. Moving on to Falkirk, um, only 309 species records, uh, 12 species there. You wouldn't really expect a difference between Falkirk and West Lothian in terms of the, the, the overall number of species. So there's some species still to be recorded there, um, you'd expect. And obviously not a large amount of recorder effort with only 309 spe uh, species records from that area. Um, a lot less in Clax and Clack Manager. Um, 91 species records, um, 10 species. Again, you'd be expecting you know, 12 to 14 species there. Um, there's no significant difference between Clack Manager and West Lothian and Falkirk, um, although this is more of an upland area. And moving on to Stirling, um, 17 species, um, lots of recording in key sites, particularly Flanders Moss has had a lot of recording there, but strangely enough, no white-faced darter, which is a bit of a mystery. So whichever area you live in, you can use the, the NBN Atlas to go and give an indication of what are the most common species that have been found there. Um, nowadays, there's more adult records, but um, if you went to the NBN 10 or 15 years or 10 years ago, you'd find most of the records are larval records. It used to be about 90% of the records that were submitted in Scotland were larval records, mainly due to the weather. Um, now we've got a very a well, much larger number of dragonfly recorders, over 100 dragonfly recorders regularly recording in Scotland. Um, and a lot of these are um, adult records. Um, so they're not so much larval records. So there's more of a parity between um, sightings of adults and sightings of larva. So common species, as I said, overall nine to 11, fairly common species in various er areas, the borders having the highest diversity. Um, four of which are damselflies and they are found in all areas. So large red, uh, common blue, emerald damselfly and blue-tailed damselfly um, are found in all of the areas. So there's only four damselflies to um, become familiar with. It's pretty straightforward to become familiar with these species um, once you encounter them on a regular basis. And there's plenty of opportunity to get new site records such as in Clack and um, in Falkirk, um, but also even in Stirling, um, there's a strong suspicion there's white-faced darter there. Um, so more recording effort in some of the, the relic peak bogs potentially um, could be very worthwhile. Um, key items required, um, again, it's pretty basic stuff. Um, so a colander, it's a bit of a Scottish thing, um, or a net, a long-handled net. Um, the colander was developed mainly by, or as an item to be used for larval collecting, was developed by Betty Smith, uh, who I mentioned earlier on. Um, she found it was most useful for when you were sifting through bog pools with a lot of sphagnum, um, and it was easier to pick out the sphagnum if you had um, a solid net, effectively, um, or a rigid net, rather. Um, 
colanders are difficult to find these days because they're either too fancy or too plain and um, you've got to have the right size of holes so that the water goes through the holes and it acts as a net rather than the water doesn't go through the holes and it just you get a boundary layer and you don't actually manage to get anything uh, in your colander so it's, it's a bit more tricky than it used to be to get a decent colander but um, it's worth persevering with uh, it also means that you don't tend to get too deep into the water, um, which is a good safety thing. Um, obviously, nets are more useful if you've got um, tricky edges to ponds and pools. Um, so it's, it's really an either, either or thing. It's whatever you have to hand. Um, a bunnet won't work. Um, you might think that's a slightly strange thing to say, but I do like to mention Betty Smith because she got me into dragonflies and she was really, really helpful, a fund of knowledge and one of the real pioneers for surveying very large areas of Scotland. And the first time she saw a dragonfly was when a colleague at her husband's work caught a dragonfly in his bonnet, put it in his lunchbox and took it to Betty because she was a science teacher and showed it to her. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Scottish tradition of um, utilising what is to hand to go and do some survey work. Um, some kind of tub or tray for your finds. So it could be Tupperware, it could be a margarine tub, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It just needs to be pale, either white, white is best because um, you get a uh, good contrast um, and, a, and a dessert sized spoon, um, usually plastic, so a white or light coloured spoon to go and inspect your catch. Um, very, very useful um, for having sort of close views. Um, and a 10 times hand lens is really useful as well for looking at the caudal lamellae, which I'll call the tail fins from now on, of damselflies, which are really the key identification feature. So you don't need an awful lot to get going. Where do you need to look for um, drag, dragonfly and damselfly larva? Well, almost exclusively it's in marginal emergent vegetation. So um, ponds, pools and lochs um, in the, the marginal and emergent vegetation, the larvae are usually uh, clinging on to there. Um, so when you sweep through the net or a colander, you will um, disturb the larvae, get them into the net or the colander and you will find your catch. Um, also the exuvia, which are the, the final larval skins that are left behind when the adults emerge from them are also found there on vegetation and shrubs close to the edge, but also on this marginal vegetation. And really the first thing you should do when you go to a pond is make sure that there's nothing emerging before you start tramping around the edge of it um, because often there will be emergent individuals if you're there between May and August and um, so the last thing you want to do is go and tread on them and um, so exuvia are very useful we'll talk about them in a wee bit um, there's only a few rare species that favour the detritus at the bottom of pools, um, things like the downy emeralds. So uh, really sifting through the detritus at the bottom and clogging up your net and then filling your tray full of um, you know, rotten leaves or whatever is not really the way forward. It's just scooping through the, the water column and uh, not getting too much uh, in your net or your colander is really the best way to go and inspect. Um, again, sweep your net or colander through the vegetation and then just inspect and keep going because sometimes it can be a nightmare to find larva. You, you try and you try and you try and you're expecting to find something um, and, and in some days you just don't find an awful lot. You'll get like one or two when you'd expect to get tens. Um, so sometimes you have to do a lot of sampling for not that many larvae. They are hard to find. A Japanese scientist did a survey with bits of potato which seemingly have the same density as a dragonfly larva and put them in a tank with ve with vegetation and found about um i think it was either between one or five percent of what he'd put in there um so it's really difficult um to to sample to, to sample so you're only going to get really a small proportion of whatever's in the pool so consequently if you find a few larvae that doesn't indicate a population status you really need to go back again and again to a site um because at different times of year um you will find um different numbers of larvae and also it's, it's very much weather dependent which you'll come on to. So in terms of proof of breeding, um, having finding a larva or a cast larval skin denotes larval presence. Um, if you've got exuvia, which is the final larval skin that's left behind when the adult emerges, that's the indication that the life cycle has been completed. And if you want to be utterly pedantic, which I sometimes am, finding ovipositing adults and the larvae of a species at a site proves breeding because you've got all of the different life stages. You've got adult, egg, larva, exuvia. So, you know, it's definitely, definitely, um, definitely happening there. But to be honest, if you're finding a larva at a site, it's, it's very, very, very likely that there's been success. There's going to be successful breeding there. So the types of larvae, um, this is a bit text heavy, but just in case people want to go back to the presentation, I thought I should put it in. Um, so damselflies, Easy to identify, they've all got three tail fins, you'll see some pictures in a wee minute, and um, they are small up to two, 22 millimetres. 
demoiselles, of which there's only one species that's been recorded, and that's in the borders, but they are moving up um, and moving north, so they will be coming uh, into the Lothians, we reckon, fairly soon. Um, so the banded demoiselle, similar to the above, but they are slightly longer, they've got much longer spidery legs, and they're found exclusively in running water. Um, they, are par they have parallel, robust horn-like antennae, which are which stick out um, and they are diagnostic because the antennae on the other damselflies are much, much smaller, not as robust, and they, they just, they're much more compact. They don't have those big spidery legs. Um, darters and chasers, again, you'll see pictures in a wee minute. Um, they're similar to each other, um, but the darters have got lateral spines either side of the central pointy bits, um, and they're um, those are only found in darters. Chasers are usually hairier, but they don't have any lateral spines at the end of their abdomen. Um, and darters, chasers, and the golden ring dragonflies have a mask covering the lower front of their head. So much like the masks everybody's wearing these days, um, they cover the lower portion of the head. So that's that separates them from um, the hawkers, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Golden ring dragonflies looks a bit like a cross between a chaser and a hawker. It's sort of a bit of a stumpy hawker. Tends to be very hairy, covered in fine particles, um, lives in slow flowing muddy or PT runnels. So quite different from the other habitats you'd find dragonflies in. You usually find large red damselflies in the same habitat sometimes, and maybe four spotted chasers, but usually nothing else. Um, the jagged jaws of the mask are diagnostic. When I mean, you see a picture of them, um, yeah, there's, there's nothing else quite like it. And the hawkers and the emperors, elongated larva, torpedo shaped, up to five and a half centimetres long. Um, they are very, very big. Um, and these individuals have got a flat plate underneath their head called a labium, um, which is how they go and catch their prey. So very different from the golden ring dragonfly and the other darters. So this is typically what you see, a female co common hawker um, laying her eggs on her own. She's overposting onto a plant. Um, the eggs will go into the plant and then they'll start emerging and um, developing immediately. All damselflies lay their eggs onto, onto vegetation. Um, chasers and darters, if you've seen them egg laying, um, they did lay directly onto the water surface and the eggs fill with water and they sink down to the bottom of the pond. Um, golden ring dragonflies lay their eggs into mud or peat. Um, so mud or peat just by the side of a runnel. And southern hawkers are an exception because they lay their eggs uh, on material beside a pond at the water's edge. Um, so on rocks, logs, um, moss, whatever. Um, but they don't actually lay their eggs into the water. So that's quite distinctive. Um, if we find a tenor adult, which is a, a pre-emergent adult, so this hasn't flown yet, um, and you don't know what it is because it's so pale, um, you can look at the exuvia, which is just to the right-hand side of the eyes, um, and that will give you an indication, well, that will tell you what the species is. So exuvia can be very useful when you're finding emergent adults that, that have no colour to them. So when they've just emerged, they are incredibly pale, um, but the exuvia will go and tell you. This is a four-spotted chaser. Um, again, the larva, um, at the late stages look exactly the same as the exuvia, so they're large, they've got good features to go and help their identification. Um, they're quite robust and it's easy to make a collection of them, which is really good for reference, really, really useful for um, reference. But for collecting exuvia, you really need to get your eye in, um, and they do get washed off or blown off the vegetation that they're on during strong winds or heavy rain, so you need a settled period of weather to have a good number of exuvia uh, to go and collect. So this is the first of our larva. This is two millimetres long. Um, it's got stripy pyjamas on. We use a lot of technical terms for dragonfly larva. Um, they've got longitudinal stripes um, and a darker central stripe going on the dorsal area. Um, if this was a, a southern hawker, it would have a line of dots, an obvious line of dots. Even at two mil, um, you can identify it. And that's a dessert-sized spoon, so it gives an indication of just how small they are. Um, this is the cast larval skin of an azure hawker one that we don't find in this area, apart from in the more upland areas of Stirling. Um, but what this shows is that the wing cases are very small. Um, this was about 22 millimetres long, so it's about almost half size. Um, and the wing cases don't really start developing until the final um, larval skins, or the final larval stages. We've got the southern hawker at the top, and we've got a large red damselfly, so we've got 45 millimetres versus 14 millimetres. Um, so quite a different size and a very different shape, the torpedo shape of the hawker and the carrot shape of the um, large red damselfly. So this is little and large, so this is about um, 14 millimetres as opposed to um, what about maybe 8 or 9 millimetres. 
Um, because their life cycle takes two years, you'll get eggs hatched in that year, which are very small, and you get adults about to emerge um, that are, you know, full size. And you can't really see it here, but the wing cases are down to the fourth segment, which indicates um, that they're about to emerge. Um, lots of bands on the legs, which is different from all the other damselfly larvae. Um, also, they've got a obvious dark X-shaped mark on the final third of the tail fins. So really, once you get your eye on for large red damselflies, you, whenever you find a larva, you ask the question, why is it not a large red damselfly? Because it's so distinctive. Um, this is an example of the tail fins. There's usually three, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, because they sometimes get nibbled off by predators. Um, they can regrow um, if they're nibbled off at the early stages. Um, they have these two blotches you can see at the top and the bottom of the tail fin in the final third, um, but usually there's a darker X-shaped mark. This is a sort of a negative, um, almost, of the markings, but usually it's a distinctive dark um, mark that you'll find. Um, large red damselfly exuvia, this was up a tree, this was in a birch tree, unusually quite far away from the pond. So you can find exuvia away from the water's edge. So it's, it's always worth just having a really good look, um, even though the exuvia are more difficult to find than the larva. But once you get your eye in, you can find them. Um, these are the tail fins, a very um, rough illustration of the different tail fins that we have. Large red, easy, it's the only one with markings in the final third uh, of the tail fin. The emerald damselfly, it's long, it's rounded, it's a third of the body length of the emerald damselfly, um, which is the longest of the tail fins you'll find, and often with one to three dark bands. We've got the blue-tailed, which has got asymmetric lines of setae or hairs um, going to almost the midpoint of the um, of the tail fin and then you've got the common blue which has got symmetrical CT and then usually one to three dark bands in the middle but sometimes the bands aren't there um, and then finally we haven't got an illustration of it but the azure damselfly uh, again has not so obvious lines of CT going to the middle but it's got a hinge called a node um, and it can sometimes have a single band there um, but if you're unsure if it's a common blue or an azure damselfly you just need to look at the back of the head so what does no date mean? It just means that there's a, a central hinge. Effectively, there's two sections to the tail fins. Um, this is most obvious in the northern damselfly, um, which we, don't, we haven't recorded uh, in the Twick area. Emerald damselfly um, swims very fishily as a larva, big long tail fins, really distinctive, not usually found up until sort of like June time um, because it hatches as an egg in March or April and then does its, all its development in a year and then starts to emerge usually at the end of June depending on what the spring's been like. So they're very distinctive larva uh, and late season they're the only larva, drag, damselfly larva that you tend to find in a pond. The azure damselfly as mentioned earlier on, spotting at the back of the head uh, is diagnostic. It's only found in the variable damselfly, the azure damselfly. Um, the variable damselfly is incredibly rare, um, so it's most likely going to be an azure damselfly. Um, the two variable and azure are inseparable in the field. Moving on to darters. Um, so darters are different from chasers because they've got lateral spines. This is a white faced darter. Um, so the central pointy bit, which can be shut to be a single point or open to have two points, but either side of that, there are lateral spines. Um, so the darters have got bulging eyes, their legs are relatively short, not spidery, they don't have tail fins, they're a bit more robust, not necessarily any longer than the damselflies, but a wee bit longer, but M16 um, mil. Uh, White-faced darter, very under-recorded, it's got golden eyes underneath, as you can see here. The black darter has got green eyes underneath. So I'm have to rush through a little bit. Um, the black darter, um, very common late season. So really from um, June, late, late July into August, it's the only darter you tend to be finding. It's small, it's got a triangular shaped head, very, very small lateral spines, almost imperceptible unless you're looking uh, underneath, um, you're looking, sorry, with a hand lens. Um, but different from the, uh, the four-spotted chaser because it's got these lateral spines. This is a four-spotted chaser. Um, with a bandit mask, which is becoming a culturally, culturally redundant um, description, but it's got a black line, usually a black line between the two eyes, different head shape, more of a rounded um, front of the head between the eyes, um, and it's got this central pointy bit, so when it's shut, it's got an obviously pointed rear end with no lateral spines to it. It tends to be a lot hairier, um, so it tends to be more covered in detritus. I mentioned the labium a little bit earlier on, so it's the flat plate and the underside of the head of the hawkers. Um, this is one from an azure hawker, but there's different ratios. So basically the southern hawker, which is 
the second most common hawker that you'll find, um, has got a very, very long, thin labium. The common hawker has got a much, much broader one. And here's a common hawker for you. Um, so common hawker, again with the stripy pyjamas, as we mentioned, this is an almost full size one and um, getting ready to go and emerge in the spoon. Uh, the southern hawker is lighter and has a line of dots, um, so sort of dorsal midpoint, um, but has a much, much narrower, almost a T-shaped labium underneath. Um, so it's really quite distinctive if you turn it over. Uh, these are some of the timings, and because I'm running over, um, you can go and have a look at them a little bit later on. But basically, if you go out looking for larvae just before they're about to emerge as adults, you'll find the most and the largest larvae, uh, which is the, um, the easiest way to go and find them. But you can find larvae pretty much all the way through the year. Um, but in the winter, obviously, with the cold water, they tend to go lower. But certainly from April all the way through to September, October, even November this year, um, you could certainly find larvae. Um, the water spider, under-recorded, but you never know. It's the only truly aquatic spider that we have, but worth looking out for. And you find all sorts when you're pond dipping. And uh, thanks very much for your attention. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks very much.